Well, at this time, I'd invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, it's been two weeks that we've taken off of our study of the book of Acts. And we return to it this morning, and you will find that passage in your pew Bible on page 1075. 1075. We come now to Paul in the city of Athens, what is commonly referred to as the Mars Hill Debate or the Mars Hill Sermon, as Paul now stands before the elite of all of the academics in the city, and he preaches the gospel to them, and uh, we see the results at the end of it. And it is a little bit of a lengthy text, as I've mentioned the last two Sundays, uh, so we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 34. So take note of that, verses 16 through 34. This is God's holy word. Let us hear it as such. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. When they took, then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us, each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them, Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. And there ends the reading of God's holy word. And brothers and sisters, as always, we are dependent now on God the Holy Spirit to grant the blessing. Let's pray for his illuminating grace this time. Our gracious God and our Heavenly Father, this morning we begin by extending our hands outward. We have come here to hear from you. Father, we have come to be fed, to have our souls nourished by nothing less than the living word that you have given, the bread of life. 
And Father, we have come to be nourished by the water of life. And so, Father, we come to hear from Christ. Father, we pray now that as we go through this text that you have given to us, we ask, Lord, that the Spirit would descend from on high, that he would fill our hearts, that he would give us understanding. Oh, Father, you know which each person this morning here needs. We ask, Lord, where correction is necessary, you would give it. Where encouragement is necessary, that you would give it in abundance. And, Father, for all of us this morning, give us faith. Lift our eyes to heaven. And, Father, that we would see Christ. And we ask this in his name alone. Amen. Well, a number of years ago, in reading a newspaper or a news article... Uh, I read of a story, a stark story of a woman waking up in the morning and uh, she went downstairs and to her great astonishment, to her great fear, uh, she found a homeless man sleeping on her couch. Uh, Somewhere in the middle of the night, the homeless man made his way into her home, found the door apparently unlocked, helped himself to all that was in the home and fell asleep on the couch. Now, as you would imagine, the woman not only was quite startled, she was quite afraid. And so she began to protest and to tell him that he needed to get out, that that this was not his house, that he was not welcome there, but he was an intruder. And the reason it was in the newspaper is because the man, as it turned out, was under the influence of drugs, and he believed that it was the home of an extended relative. And he kept arguing with her, saying that he actually was welcome there, that, that his uncle or whatever allowed him to come. And And eventually, she had to call the cops, and he had to be removed. Uh, This intruder thought that he was welcomed there, despite the fact that it was not his home. It was the woman's home. Well, this morning, there's a similar scene taking place in the story of Paul in Athens. Paul comes to this city, and he is shocked. He is dismayed. In fact, he is perturbed, the text says, because there's intruders in God's creation. The city is filled with idols. The city is filled from beginning to end with false gods and false worship. And Paul is stirred with anger because this is God's world. This is God's creation. These are God's people, as it were. These people owe all that they have to the true and living God. And yet they haven't allowed, they've allowed an intruder to take up residence in God's creation. And so the text is quite stark because Paul is so moved then he actually goes out into the marketplace to speak against this. Paul is so moved by what he sees, he's so angered by the lack of honor for the glory of the true and living God, that he actually goes out into the marketplace to call people to repent of this and to remove the intruder from God's world, to drive out false worship. And so as we come here, we see actually Paul now preaches a sermon in the Areopagus, and he preaches a message of a creator, a creator who owns all things and to whom everybody, whether they believe or not, owes all allegiance to. And then Paul ends the sermon by calling for them to respond to that message, to respond in repentance, to turn their life from this wickedness unto the true and living God. Now it's stark, isn't it, that Paul from beginning to end faces mockery. Paul knew exactly what he was going to face, and yet, the point this morning that I hope to show you, it was jealousy for God's glory that drove him to do it. It was jealousy for the truth. It was a concern for the people. All of this drove Paul to the moment where he knew he would be rejected and mocked, and yet, he did it because there was an intruder in the house. Now, we need to be reminded of the context. It's been a couple of weeks, and we find Paul really on the run for his life. Uh, Three Sundays ago, we noted that he preached in two cities, Thessalonica and Berea, and the sermon centered on the two responses that he found. And as we left the scene, Paul had to leave Berea because the Jews from Thessalonica came to chase him away again. And so he left behind Timothy. He left behind uh, those men who were with him, and he fled all alone. And so he finds himself in Athens now, all alone. And we learned this morning that Christ puts Paul there to have a clash of worldviews. Here's my theme. We learned this morning that the truth of God always clashes with the lies of this world. The truth of God, the truth of the gospel always clashes with the lie of this world. They cannot dwell together. Three points this morning, and I'm simply just going to go through the text with you. 
First of all, we need to know Paul's provocation. Why was Paul provoked and what did that cause him to do? Secondly, Paul's proclamation. This is where I'm going to have to summarize quite a bit. But I want to go through the sermon and note what he said and why he said it in the context of Athens. And then thirdly and finally, Paul's persistence. Paul's persistence, and what I mean by that is the outcome and how Paul persists despite mockery and also some converting. So, first of all, look with me then at Paul's provocation. And we see that provocation right away in verse 16 because of a jealousy. Look at verse 16 with me. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he, and here's the word, was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And so the story picks up, here's Paul, he is in the city of Athens, and if you know anything about Greek history, this is a prominent and important city. The city of Athens was, this, was the center of much of the culture of the Greeks. In fact, actually, Rome, when it conquered all of Greece, so prized the culture of Greek heritage, they allowed Athens to be an independent city to honor them for their history and what they had done. Athens was the center of Greek architecture. It was the center of Greek art. It was the center of learning and academics. It was the height of philosophy. If you were to excel in learning wisdom and philosophy, everyone said you had to go to Athens. This is where you went to learn. And so here's Paul now in this massive city filled with rich heritage, but you see he's not there for the tour. He's not there finding tourism. He's there and he sees idolatry. As Paul makes his way around the city, the text tells us that he became overwhelmed with the number of idols in the city. Interestingly, 50 years after Paul was in Athens, there's a Roman writer who quipped about Athens that it's easier to find a god or a goddess than a human being in Athens. That's exactly what Paul found there. The city was just rife with idolatry. Now notice that word. Paul says, or, or rather the text says of Paul, that he was greatly distressed. Uh, in the Greek, that word means to be very irritated, to be provoked within, to be stirred up, to be visibly distraught at what he was seeing. And we need to ask the question, why was Paul distraught? Why, why was he provoked? And the first reason is because of jealousy for God's name. Paul knew the true and living God, and all around him were people who were brought into this world by this true and living God, but they were denying worship to him. They were worshiping stone. They were worshiping idols made of gold. They were looking at these things that God had made, and they were attributing their life to those idols. And you see, Paul is jealous for God. Paul is angry that these people would deny God the worship that is due his name. But I think there's another reason why Paul was distressed. Paul was distressed because here's this city which claims to be wise, but everywhere he looked, he saw fools. People on their way to hell, people on their way to judgment, and all along the way, blinded to the reality that they were seeing. These are people who owe allegiance to God and yet were denying it to him. And so Paul was provoked greatly for jealousy. Now notice what this causes him to do. It provokes him to speak out against it. Verse 17 says, So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Paul was so agitated that he went into the streets to talk about it. Uh, he begins, as he always does, by finding a synagogue. This is his usual pattern. Interestingly, we're not told the response of the Jews there. We're simply told he went in the synagogue, and then he went out of the synagogue to go into the marketplace. He went to the Jew first, but that was not enough. Paul wanted to get to the Greeks. And so Paul went to the marketplace. Uh, this was the common place of meeting. This is the common place where news would have taken place. And this was a common place where you would interact with one another. And so Paul stands literally on a street corner as people were buying their groceries, and he is shouting out to them that they are wrong. Now notice that. Paul is so provoked that he's willing to put himself on a street corner to shout out to all who would listen that they need to turn to the true and living God. 
He is so provoked that he speaks out against it. He is not content to allow these people to continue to live in a lie. He is not content to allow these people to persist in denying the true and living God, so he speaks out publicly against it. Now you notice this actually gets the attention of some people. Look at verse 18, what happens when he does this. We read a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what does this babbler trying to say? Others remark, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Paul was preaching and it got the attention of two philosophers, or rather two groups of philosophy. Uh, I want to note what they taught here. It's important in a moment for how he preaches to them. But first of all, there's our Epicurean philosophers. What do they believe? Well, the Epicureans taught that the soul ends with death, much like our modern notion that is being taught in our own day and age. The Epicureans were a philosophy that said the soul ends upon death, and the chief goal of the human life is pleasure. You are to do all that you can since you only get one go around to get as much pleasure and joy out of life as you can because when you die, you just cease to exist. And in fact, they taught that if there were gods, they were distant, they were removed. And so life for the Epicureans was just random chance events. Whatever happens to you, it's just like a roll of a dice. And so you just gotta make the best with the hand that's given to you and try to get as much as much pleasure as you can. The second group is kind of the opposite of the Epicureans. This is the Stoics. The Stoics believed that everything is God. Here's your fancy word for the day. They were what we would call pantheists or panentheists. They believed that everything was a part of God, that that creation was God, that you were God, that just everything is like this massive spiritual being that you are part of. It's very much like New Age spirituality uh, Near Eastern spirituality that is taught today. They, however, taught that the goal of human life was apathy. You heard the to ter uh, term being stoical. It comes from their teaching. They said the way to find joy in life is just being apathetic, just to try to ignore the suffering, to just try to bury your head in the sand and just get through it. And then eventually when you die, like Buddhism teaches, you're just going to join the great God in the sky. You're going to merge in and unite with all of creation. While these two groups now begin to mock Paul, notice that they call him a babbler. That's a significant term. It means seed picker. It means a babbler, one who just assembles a bunch of ideas that are not his own, and they were scoffing at him. They said, here's this man. He's a fool. He's nothing but a babbler. Others said that he was simply preaching about foreign gods. They were confused about the message. Well, what is the point this morning? Why does Luke tell us all of these details? And I think here's the point. Notice that Paul was not content to stand in his own comfort bubble, but he went outside his comfort zone to be mocked. Paul, who was jealous for God, was so filled with jealousy that he stood on a street corner and proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ to people he knew would not be openly receptive of it. Now, believer this morning, how convicting is that? As I thought on it this week, I had to ask myself, am I jealous for God's glory? Am I jealous for God's glory, or am I content to allow the world around us to live and walk falsely before God? Am I so jealous for my neighbor's eternal state that I'm willing to get outside my comfort zone to speak the truth of God to those who desperately need to hear it? You see, this morning, Paul is filled with a spirit that leads to jealousy so that he will stand on a street, street corner because he's so convicted of the truth. There is one truth, and people are living a lie, and Paul will do anything in his power to keep them from continuing that lie, including being mocked and called a babbler. And believer, this morning, be reminded that this gospel message was just as off-putting then as it is today. He knew that they would not be happy to hear the message. And so there is Paul's provocation. Now, secondly now, we need to hear Paul's proclamation. Paul's proclamation. Paul now goes and gives a sermon in the middle of the Areopagus. Here's where I'm going to try to summarize. If you have your Bibles open, 
just look at the references as I go through it. But in verses 19 through 21, Paul is invited to speak in front of the local council. Now, this local council was a group of high-ranking learned men. Uh, Today, they would be like the PhDs of the Ivy League colleges. These are like the board members who watch over PhD studies of Harvard and Yale. They were the men who guarded the teaching of the city. And you notice that Luke tells us the reason they wanted to hear from him is because all they like to do is to hear new ideas. You see, Athens had gotten to a point now where they weren't really trying to find truth. They thought that just debating truth was the point. They weren't really looking to find reality and truth. They just wanted to talk about it and have fun debates and hear about something new. And so here's Paul, and they said, this will be fun. Let's bring him before the council. It's a new idea. We'll talk about it, and then we'll just go about our lives. And so here's the point. Paul now finds himself not only being invited, but brought in front of the council of the highest learned men in all of Athens. He has an open invitation now to preach the gospel to these men. How does he do it? Let's go through it. First of all, in his proclamation, he begins by saying he has a truth for their ignorance. A truth for their ignorance. That's verses 22 and 23. You notice there in verse 22 that Paul begins his address with this line, men of Athens. And the commentaries I read this week noted that that was the proper, honorable, respectful way that you begin a dialogue with philosophers. Uh, Paul is not trying to offend people. He's not trying to hurt their feelings. Paul is actually being honorable and honoring them, seeking to gain an audience so they will listen to him. And notice here that he acknowledged that they're very religious. That's his bridge into the gospel. Paul says, listen, I've walked around the city, and one thing I've noticed about you is you're very spiritual. You are a very spiritual people. I see idols everywhere I go. And you notice Paul says, how spiritual are you? You are so concerned for, pet or for idol worship that you even have a, an idol to an unknown God. In other words, what the Athens, Athenians would do is they built this altar just in case they missed a deity. Just in case there was one random God out there that they had not heard about, they built this, this altar to make sure they were appeasing that God. And Paul says, listen, man, you guys got religion covered. You are a very spiritual people. You are a very religious people crowd. And now Paul says here, I will give you clarity to that unknown God. You want to know who that unknown God is? That is whom I will proclaim to you. You have a, a problem with ignorance and I can instruct you. Paul is being a little bit clever here, by the way. These men were proud PhD scholars. They thought they were the height of wisdom. And Paul says, listen, you even acknowledge that you're a little bit ignorant. Paul is gently leaning into him, saying, listen, let me help you with that little bit of ignorance that you have. So he has a truth for their ignorance. Second point of his sermon, he proclaims the truth of God. He proclaims the truth of God in verses 24 and 25. Now notice where Paul begins. Paul says, the unknown God that I serve, the God I'm proclaiming, who is he? He is the creator of heaven and earth. In other words, he is the sole creator of all things. He is the creator of everything in heaven. He is the creator of everything on earth. He owns all things. Now, already in that, Paul is pressing into their pagan notions of creation. Paul says, the unknown God, the God I serve, listen, he is the sole creator. He owns all things. I notice that he leads into that by saying, since that's true, he doesn't live in a temple. Again, Paul sees temples everywhere, but Paul says, listen, my God cannot live in a temple. He created all things. A temple is far too small. My God dwells everywhere. He created all things. He does not dwell in temples made by human hands. And notice who this God is. He's sovereign. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need your worship. He doesn't need your service. In fact, notice how Paul flips it on them. You need him. You see, pagan worship was all about the gods needing the Greeks. They, they worshiped the gods because they viewed their gods as being dependent upon them. Paul says, no, 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 no. My God is dependent upon no one. In fact, my God is the one you need because he gave you life. He gave you everything. You owe everything to God. He's the one who is giving you all that you have. 
Notice that Paul is now confronting their worldview on what a God really is. Paul is saying that God is sovereign over all things. And the last thing you need to understand about how Paul is pressing into the worldview is that this would confront them in the fact that God is distant. Again, the Epicureans thought that the gods were distant and didn't care about them. Paul says, listen, he gave you life. He's near to you. He cares about his creation. The actual reality is that the God is the giver and provider of all things. The next point in his sermon, he proclaims the truth of men. He goes from the truth of God now to the truth of men. That's verses 26 through 28. Who is man in relation to God? Well, Paul tells them. It says that the true God created all mankind from one man. Paul says, he doesn't quote from the Old Testament, but we know who this one man is. This is Adam. Paul says man didn't just pop out of nowhere, but actually God created one man, and every person on the planet comes from Adam. All people flow through this one man. Now, it doesn't really pertain to our purpose this morning, but I don't want to pass over this by just noting that that text alone refutes any idea of evolution that would teach Adam not as a real man. The Bible necessitates that Adam is real. God created Adam and that every human being, you and I, come from Adam at the beginning. They need to also understand that this would have been offensive to the Greeks. The Greeks were very proud people. They thought they were separate from all other people groups. They thought they had a leg up. And Paul says, I got another, I got information for you. You're actually no better than anyone else. Because God created one man and you actually come from that one man. You're equal with every other people group. And you go on, notice what he says about man. Man is dependent on God. God is the one who determines the lives of all people. He determines the location that they live in, and he determines the length of their life. That would have been humbling to them. You're not in control of your life. God gives you a birthday. God gives you a death day. God gives you to the family that you've been given to. God ordained everything that happens to every human being who has ever lived. And so here, nothing is random or given to chance, but God is behind it. And now notice here, God reveals himself in creation. Paul now goes through a list even of their own poets, and he says, God has shown himself so much so that you know there's a God that exists. He's not left you without revelation in creation. Now, what is the point in this? How is Paul confronting their views about themselves? A couple ways here I want to know. One, he's confronting their pride in a very wise way. These were proud men. And Paul says, you have no reason to be proud. You're actually blind. But Paul was also confronting them with the reason that they were living. These men thought the purpose of their life was themselves. They thought the purpose of their life was their own pleasure. They thought the purpose of their life was just getting the best out of this life and then dying and it's all over. Paul says, that's not the goal. The goal is God. You were created for a purpose. You owe him your allegiance. You've got your own life all flipped upside down. You're living for the wrong reason. And you notice here that Paul actually quotes from some of their own poets to show them that you know that idol worship is foolish. We don't have time to get into those quotes, but what Paul is essentially saying is your own wisdom shows you that your gods cannot be made of of metal. And so your own religion is contradictory. Lastly, and now this is where Paul gets heated. Paul doesn't leave them alone, but notice that he preaches the truth of accountability. The truth of accountability in verses 29 through 31, Paul says it's obvious that God is not made of silver or gold and that you are worshiping idols and it's offending him. But notice what Paul says. Throughout human history, God has been patient to overlook this. God has not brought judgment upon you yet. God has not brought destruction on you. He's been patient with you up to this moment. Now, what is Paul saying there? Paul is not saying that God was okay with idolatry. Not that God was fine with it, but what Paul is saying, God put up with your idolatry. God was patient with your idolatry. And listen, God is a gracious God. He is angered by what you've done, but he sent me now to call you unto him. And notice now, God will not look over it forever, but there is a day of judgment that will come. Paul says There will be a day where you will be accountable for how you lived your life before this God. Now listen, once again, we are reminded that that is just as offensive in Paul's day as it is today. 
Paul is saying, you owe allegiance to this God that you know exists, and you are guilty before this God, and there is a day where he is sending his son, and he will come in judgment, and if you are not made right with him, you will face all the justice that you have heaped up upon yourself. There is an accountability from this God that they are denying worship. And you notice how he ends. Paul calls them to repent of their idolatry before it's too late. Paul says you can't keep going on this path. You must turn, you must repent, and come unto the true and the living God. And then he ends with this, that Jesus' resurrection proves that this judgment is happening In other words, he's saying that there was one who came and died, and this man was raised again from the dead after he had incurred all judgment of his people, and he will come once again to judge the living and the dead. And so Paul ends his sermon by saying, in real time and space, God has proven this. He sent someone to die on the cross. That person died and spent three days in the grave. And then he rose him from the dead. And that very one who rose again from the dead, the one who hung on the cross in payment for sins of his people, that very one you will stand before on judgment day. God has said through the resurrection, this will be certain. And so he calls for them to repent. Much like the example that we began with, with the police needing to evict that man, homeless man, so also there will be one day where God the Father will send the Son, and the Bible tells us the angels will pull people out of the mountains to face judgment. Judgment is coming when Christ returns. What is the point of this sermon this morning? The point that we need to note is that Paul wisely but boldly confronts the false worldviews of his day. Notice that. Paul speaks to them in such a way as to be loving, honorable. He doesn't go out of his way to offend them. He wants to have an audience with them, so he, he does everything to speak in such a way that they'll be listening, but then he also doesn't hold anything back. Paul doesn't soften the edges of the gospel. Paul doesn't avoid judgment. Paul doesn't even avoid the call to repentance, but he goes there. Why? Because that's the only hope of these people. Paul knows exactly what the reality is. If he does not call them to repent and to turn, one, they will continue to go about their godless ways, and two, when they die, they will face judgment for all eternity. And so Paul gets out of his comfort zone. He proclaims repentance unto these desperate people with love and boldness in his voice. Listen, this morning, believer, that teaches you and me the duty of every Christian to evangelize. Uh, I'm someone who struggles with the fear of man. When I'm in that checkout line at the counter and I have an opportunity to speak, I'm overwhelmed with fear. What is this person going to think of me? We see this morning, the only way you and I are going to get over that fear, like Paul, is to be jealous for God's name. To realize that there is one truth and that our neighbors are living a lie and it's our job. We've been left here to speak out against that lie because God loves them. And we are called to go into the nations. We're called to share this message knowing, knowing that it will not be popular with many. And yet for love and boldness for God, we will go and we will speak out to the world. Now, thirdly and finally, Notice Paul's persistence here. Paul's persistence in the face of two reactions. First reaction is rejection. Look at verse 32. It says, When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. In other words, the first reaction is to avoid Paul. First of all, they laughed at him. Many of them mocked. You need to understand that in Greek philosophy, they viewed the body as bad. So this idea of a resurrection from the dead was just absurd to them. All their lives from being a little kid on, they were taught that the spirit is good, the body is bad, and that the goal of human life is to get out of this body. And now here Paul says, listen, there's a resurrection. So this group laughs at him. They say, that's foolishness. Our worldview doesn't allow for that. I don't believe that. I don't like that. So they mock him. Second group of rejection is just pure apathy. These people don't want to make a decision one way or the other, so they just say, listen, Paul, we'll hear you again another day. Please go away. Again, Paul stood before this group knowing that this would be the result. They would be laughed, he would be laughed at and mocked, and yet he persisted boldly. But notice, wonderfully, there's a second result. Look at verse 34. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them were Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. 
I want us to believe her. Verse 34 is why Paul did what he did. Verse 34 is why Paul continues to preach the gospel. Why did Paul preach? Paul continues to preach because there is an elect that the good shepherd is bringing in. And a small group that heard him that day were brought to faith through the Holy Spirit's work in their life. Now there are two people listed here. One is a leader, or we're called, he's a member of the Areopagus. And uh, that is simply that he was a high-ranking member of the council. And yet he was converted. We're also told a woman named Damaris, we don't know anything else about her other than that she believed, with a number of others. Here's the point. There is a small group of elect that God loves. There's a small group of elect that Jesus gave his life for. Why did Paul preach that day? Paul preached because the good shepherd of the sheep sent him to bring these sheep in. And that is exactly what he did by grace. And this morning, I think the point is this. Paul could persist because he knew the gospel. Who is our king this morning? He is a king who didn't take his comfort and his glory so much so that he was not willing to come for us. Listen, our Savior was willing to come from heaven to be rejected by his own as we read from John 1. Who is our Savior but the eternal Son of God who created all things and then came to this broken world to be rejected, to be stripped bare, to be mocked and reviled while he was nailed to a cross. You see, believer, who is the greatest one who loved you? It is the Lord Jesus Christ, you see. And Paul could endure whatever mocking that day because his Savior went ahead of him. Yes, Paul could be mocked because his Savior was mocked. Paul could preach the gospel because he knew Jesus did something on the cross for sinners. See, Paul was so riveted by the reality of the cross, it didn't matter if he was mocked. He knew that Jesus would convert those whom he died for. And so he preached the gospel. Believer, that's got to be our hope this morning. We gotta be so riveted by what Christ did and so convicted that he desires to save and has saved that we go out into the world sharing that gospel with the world. Well, in conclusion, we are far past our time. Let me briefly summarize three thoughts of application. What does this teach you and me this morning? Three things. First of all, it teaches you and me that we must be jealous for God's glory. We must be jealous for God's glory. Listen. There is one truth, that there is one God who created all things, and that God is to be worshipped, and we have rebelled against him. And we are to be jealous for that God. That is the reason we are called to go in the world. That is the reason we are to be distressed by the world. We're not to be distressed, listen, we're not to be distressed by our culture because it makes you uncomfortable by what you see on TV. You know, we can fall into this danger of finger pointing, saying the problem is just them, them, them. But the reality is, we've been left here Because those people are rebelling against God. And we are to, in love, go to them and to warn them. Second thought that we should learn. It teaches you and me that we must not water down the gospel to make it more acceptable. Again, Paul knew that the resurrection was offensive. He knew repentance was offensive. And yet he continued to proclaim it. He did not water it down. When you and I share the gospel, we must go out of our way not to be unnecessarily offensive. But listen... There is no way you will make the gospel not offensive. We're going to have to call people to repent. We're going to have to tell them they are sinners, that they're rebels. The gospel message must not be watered down. Thirdly and finally and briefly, it teaches you and me that we are to ask God to have a love for the lost. We're to have a love for the lost and we are to acknowledge what the Bible says about them is true. That there is judgment day. And we're not to go about our business just casually letting them live their life. We are to be gripped with love for them to speak out because we know what the future is. Two closing questions then for you and I by way of application. First of all, do you and I love God enough to tell the world? Second question, do you and I love our neighbors enough to warn them? That's what Paul shows us in this passage. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Heavenly Father, this morning, grip our hearts with the truth of your word, we pray. Oh, Father, we ask that you would give us a jealousy for your name, a jealousy for the truth that we know is all around us. Oh, Father, we ask that you would grip our hearts with love for Christ. We thank you for his willingness to come, to suffer, and to die. Oh, now use us, we pray, Father, to go into this world ahead of this week, we pray. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.